When we first meet the last Ronin in issue 1, we know this story is going to be rough and violent and deeply personal. Our protagonist is clad in all black and armed with the weapons of all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Michelangelo's nunchucks, Leonardo's katanas, Donatello's bow staff, and Raphael's size. Throwing stars defeat security cameras while grappling hooks allow him to ascend walls and pass razor wire. He wades through nasty, ice-cold muck and sludge as he moves towards his target deep in the bowels of a future New York City. Time to finish this or die trying, he says to himself, an angry, snarling grimace on his face. This isn't the happy-go-lucky jokester, the pizza-eating teenager of before. No, this is a turtle who walked through the fires of adversity and came out the other side forever changed. This is the last Ronin. Let's talk about him. All the way back in 1987, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird were working on their still new property, just wrapping up issue 11 at that time. When they first created TMNT, it was Michelangelo that they made first. So this, the last story, was always going to end with Mikey 2. Ideas were made and put aside. Others pushed forward and made it to publication. The original story outline imagined a dystopian future for the Turtles, a possible end to the franchise. It was to be gritty and tragic, yet still fun. So then, after permission from Peter Laird, who'd distanced himself from the property, along with Nickelodeon and IDW Publishing, Kevin Eastman gave the blessing to Tom Waltz, editor Bobby Kernow, and the creative team on TMNT to let this story out of the archives and into the world. And so, The Last Ronin was born. The original idea was that this would be set in the future. Now we're talking about 2049, and the Turtles had split up after Raphael attacked and hurt Splinter. Raph left. Splinter announced he was going to Japan to die, and Donatello went with him. Leo got really goofy, and Mikey much more serious, so the pair split up after a while, with Leo teaming up with Casey Jones. April O'Neil was now handicapped from an explosion during a Foot Clan attack. Shredder had been killed, and a new force rose up in the vacuum left in the wake of his death. This is the core of the story that The Last Ronin was adapted from. They also infused neo-noir, cyberpunk, and sci-fi fantasy elements a la Blade Runner, Fifth Element, The Terminator, and even Heavy Metal Magazine. That coupled with the trippy surrealism of Mobius and the film noir stylings of Frank Miller and The Dark Knight Returns. The franchise also maintains its Daredevil and Ronin-era Miller influence as well, which itself was inspired by the ever-popular Lone Wolf and Cub. So after a long-standing truce with the Foot Clan that was put in place after Shredder died was broken, the end was near. Splinter was ambushed and gravely wounded after being attacked by the Foot Clan. So, deeply infuriated, Raphael went out for revenge against Oroko Karai, the daughter of Oroko Saki, aka Shredder, and the mother to Araki Hiroto, the new master of the Foot Clan in the future. Evoking images of Miller's Electra, Karai is an adaption of Karai from 1992's City at War story. Raphael tried to kill Karai, but she stabbed him in the neck so deep the blade came out of his mouth. The creator of the Mausers, still used in 2049, named Baxter Stockman, tried to recover Fugitoid, which led to both Casey Jones and Leonardo being killed. Most of Leo and Casey's strike team were also killed. The same battle that wounded April O'Neil, but those that survived went underground and began the resistance efforts. Then the Foot Clan finished off Donatello and Splinter, leaving one left. Michelangelo, a warrior now without a master, a ronin, the last ninja turtle, the last ronin. In many ways, this story parallels the revenge of the 47 ronin or revenge of the Soga brothers of Japanese legend. So the strike team that Splinter had set up continued on, but eventually with help from Commander Avayon, transformed into the rock bottom resistance. Mikey left New York and headed to Japan to save his family. That failed and so he set himself on a path that led deep into the forest and up snow-covered mountains. He wanted to find refuge and solace, to find a place for an honorable end. His healing factor wouldn't let him die, so instead he found solitude and began meditating and retreating into Splinter's book for balance and peace. Eventually he came to the conclusion that it was up to him to restore honor to his family. As long as there was no peace, he wouldn't know peace. So he set about on his last mission, which was to kill the last of the Oroku. Before he left the wilderness sanctuary though, he was attacked by Death Worms men who burned a nearby village to get to what they viewed as a monster. Michelangelo let years of built up pain and anger out, his motions deliberate, precise, and painful as he made quick work of those guys. He spent months fleeing through the countryside, then ventured into the unified Korean Republic by swimming from the southern edge of Hokkaido to the mainland where he continued to fight along the way. The ghosts of his family spoke to him in his mind, directing his journey back to Hiroto, which meant New York City. So he hopped a southbound train to a ferry, which was when Death Worm's soldiers caught up with him finally, attacking him with shards of glass from broken bottles. He ended up finding refuge on Shiburajima Island, a landmass in the Sea of Japan just north of Okayama and Hiroshima. 
He ran into Master Yip of the Hamato clan in a rather serendipitous encounter. Master Yip was an elite sensei who also trained Master Splinter, so he trained Mikey more, then told Mikey that defeating Death Worm would allow him to then focus on taking down the remainder of the Foot Clan to fulfill his destiny. The trail led him to Inner Mongolia and to Shormagan Noyan, who Michelangelo sought aid from. Mikey had been attacked and was now blind. The Mongolian warrior tribe gave Michelangelo a yurt to rest in. It was Noyan who taught Mikey how to see without sight. They then armed him with electrically charged Tomfa. Deathworm's men attacked again, killing his helper, Geralt. Abigail Finn's minions brought him to a monster gladiator trading camp in Kazakhstan where he'd have to fight to the death like the one he was in in a thunderdome in Ukraine fighting the only friend he made, a guy named Shaka. They had microbombs implanted in their necks that would detonate if they tried to escape too. Mikey and Shaka did what they needed to survive, killing, while watching each other's six. That is, until they were forced to fight each other. Shaka was about to rebel instead of killing his friend, so his bomb went off and he was taken out, to the horror of Michelangelo. His prize for winning by default, though, was his freedom. As soon as he got his stuff, he took a side at Abigail's throat and demanded death worm. That journey took him around Europe, through Italy, and to a Roman Colosseum. He impaled his sigh in the forehead of one of Deathworm's soldiers, then met the man himself, Ogoi Korkoi. They fought with fists and blades until Michelangelo took Deathworm down with his tomfa still crackling with energy as the fried Deathworm cooked in the dirt at his feet. He then stowed away a freight vessel and headed for the east coast of North America. Mikey set about to strike at the Foot Clan in New York. In the present day, Mikey again infiltrated New York City and stole a motorcycle then crashed it into a fuel truck using the blast wave to propel him up the side of a building. He then used smoke bombs when he saw robotic security guards wielding katanas nearby. And as he continued to penetrate deeper into the facility, he kept in mind the first real lesson that their sensei, Master Splinter, taught the turtles. Strike hard, fade away, never lose focus. Not to be confused with strike hard, strike first, no mercy, Michelangelo continued to fight with the Robocops as he leaped between flying cars, firmly cementing this as a future story. In this story, the cops are called Sinjas or Synthetic Ninjas. He continued to fight and slice his way to his target, which was still the new master of the Foot Clan. Meanwhile, Hiroto got word of the disturbance that Mikey was causing in the Middle District and he ordered the alarm sounded with deadly force authorized. He planned to televise the entire thing, thinking it would dissuade future insubordinates from acting out. Pursuit, capture, and execution were the orders broadcast to the entire city. Inside Hiroto's own tower, Mikey battled with legions of Captain Akusa's soldiers, pushing ever closer to contact with the highest of value targets. Mikey continued to fight through the troops, even falling out a window, but he wouldn't give up. Broken and bathed in blood, Mikey cried out, Come face me, Hiroto, you coward. Mikey needed to regroup to get to cover, so he quickly egressed from the area and made his way back into the sewers. He was about to commit seppuku to rejoin his brothers and their father to end his agony, but he collapsed just as Casey Marie Jones found him. One of Eastman's designs note that Casey Marie Jones should be crow-like, hence her appearance. Jones is the daughter of April O'Neil and Casey Jones, included to have the dynamic of, as Eastman describes it, gunfighter superhero Jedi Knight and the young gun sidekick Padawan. Mikey dreamed of his brothers just as he imagined them by his side in his present day. Not true ghosts, but a haunting of his past in his own mind. When he awoke, he discovered that a weary, worn, and aged April O'Neil had saved him. She had physical scars, a prosthetic leg and arm, and psychological scars of the last days of the Turtle Team. She would have flashbacks and nightmares, just as Mikey did, of the fateful time when Splinter was ambushed by the Foot Clan and gravely wounded. With time, April tells us that Mikey's mutation has continued to progress, making him more mutant but also bigger and stronger and with a faster healing factor. And it's then that Mikey meets Casey Marie Jones for the first time, now that he's conscious anyway. More, that they're part of the underground resistance, fighting against the Foot Clan and higher class society, living up in higher elevations in New York City. Hiroto then broadcast himself to the city to announce that a mutant monster was afoot in the city and that this crime was punishable by death. Until the monster was hunted down and neutralized, captured or killed, the entire city was being put under martial law. And then April revealed that she had Fugitoid. He was part of the plan. To get to Hiroto, they'd need Fugitoid to take down Baxter Stockman and all of his systems first. To even the odds, April showed Michelangelo their new battle wagon, which evoked design elements of Batman's tumbler and even the Colonial Marine's APC from Aliens. In one talk between Mikey and April, where Mikey told her of the time when Shredder's forces ambushed Splinter at the peace talks, April revealed that the turtle's mutagen DNA was passed on to Casey from her parents, who'd acquired trace amounts from long-term exposure to the TMNT team. Because of that, young Casey now had increased speed and strength and her own healing abilities. Michelangelo, by the way, had taken up the role of sensei to Casey. 
Michelangelo Casey and the Resistance then assaulted Stockman's fortress on Roosevelt Island, an attack that was met with Mecca and a heavily armed garrison of cybernetic troops. They attacked from the ground and the air, while April breached the front door with the armored fighting vehicle. The plan was to get to Stockman's system since he designed all of Hiroto's systems and tech. Inside, Fugitoid completely eviscerated Stockman and then shut down the power grid, locking Hiroto out of control. Back at the lair, Mikey continued to talk with his fallen brothers. The city fell, and so Hiroto donned his battle armor and clashed violently with Michelangelo after Mikey made quick work of his robotic Praetorian guard. They were blasted outside, smashing through skylights, tumbling through the night sky surrounded by shards of razor-sharp glass and thick splintered wood, striking at each other with every opening. The entirety of their family's conflict with each other expressed in each of their offensive attacks. Michelangelo impaled Hiroto through his liquid metal armor with a sigh, then smashed him with a pole. When he hit the pavement on Bleecker Street, Mikey then stabbed him with a katana in the torso, plunging it deeper into his body with a fearsome sidekick, courtesy of Leonardo. Hiroto drew blood with his claws, so Mikey used a sharp of a bow staff thrown at Hiroto's face to make some distance between himself and his foe. In the sewer, Mikey struck Hiroto in the face with a nunchuck, striking the armor off of Hiroto piece by piece. Then, at the end of the sewer, where the sludge met the sea, Michelangelo took down the last of Shredder's family. He was broken, alone and face down in the mud at the bottom of the world. Defiant to the last, Hiroto was finally defeated. It was this fight that took Michelangelo's life too though. His last breath was drawn, knowing he returned honor to his family, that his father and brothers were now avenged. Justice restored, a family reunited, a city saved, a hero in a half shell. But the cycle was soon to repeat itself as April and Casey had mutated and were now growing four new turtles back at their lab. The pair loved their baby mutants, raising them like children and training them in martial arts. A decade later and the city continued to rebuild while April and Casey continued to raise their little ninja turtles to carry on with Michelangelo and Splinter's legacy. And so the story of the last Ronin and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles carries on into an uncertain future. We'll get more than just comic books too. An RPG game is currently in development and in early 2024, a live action R-rated feature film was announced as in development at Paramount by producer Walter Hamada. That script is being written by Tyler Burton Smith who wrote Bill Skarsgård's Boy Kills World. And so there you have it my friends, the story of the last Ronin. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.